Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Automating and Integrating Pantheon with Other Services. Your speakers for today are Ari Gold, Product Manager here at Pantheon, along with our guest speakers, Brian Thompson and Dave Wykiff, Lead Software Engineers at MindGrub. Just a few housekeeping items to go over before we start. Please make sure you submit any questions you have during the presentation in the question window, or tweet them at GetPantheon. We will answer as many of the questions as we can during the Q&A portion of today's presentation. Also, this webinar will be recorded and the recording will be made available to everyone next week. I'd now like to turn it over to the team. Hi, my name is Ari. I'm a product manager here at Pantheon. Um, before joining the product team, I was an enterprise onboarding manager helping guide um, our high value clients to a successful launch. And before that, um, you know, I was building websites, uh, most recently with Arizona State University. So I can um, relate to this picture. You know, building websites, sometimes it feels like you're on a, an assembly line. There's a lot of repetitive tasks, things that you have to do over and over again. So, um, you know, there's lots of complexity, lots of detail, uh, lots of tedium. Um, you know, and the fact is, human beings are, are not good at robot work. So here at Pantheon, we want to make the robots do the work. And we think you probably do too. So, you know, this is, this, you know, fast forward to today, this is what a, an auto plant looks like. Um, you might see a human somewhere, but mostly robots are doing the work. And, um, you know, we can do that with websites too. So, you know, just kind of reviewing some automation benefits. It frees developer time to improve quality, skills, or deliver features faster. Machines aren't prone to human error. Um, it improves project visibility through dependable notifications. So, you know, um, Pantheon helps you automate a lot of this, but we're not gonna do everything. We're not building a monolith. You know, we're one gear in a whole constellation of services that, that you've probably come to rely on, whether it's Jira for issue tracking, New Relic to monitor your application's performance. Maybe you're using Travis CI, Circle CI, Jenkins to do continuous integration. So, you know, we really want to make it easier to integrate with these different services. So, um, you know, we've released a, a new suite of tools, cloud integration tools. And that consists of Quicksilver platform hooks, the Pantheon YAML config file, um, Terminus command line interface, and uh, SAML centralized authentication. So we'll, we'll look at each of those today. So um, the last one first, SAML centralized authentication for single sign-on. Um, you can see there an animated uh, GIF of, of me logging into the Pantheon dashboard. When I type in my email address, it detects single sign-on. It redirects to our configured IDP, our identity provider. And there, you know, we've implemented some two-factor authentication. I actually have to fish out a YubiKey, put it in a USB slot for me to be able to authenticate. So, you know, um, you can use SAML today to integrate Pantheon into your organization-wide security strategy. Um, again, it'll let, let you authenticate against your identity provider when you log into the Pantheon dashboard. And, um, you know, we find this is common th that people are already using this, like, in a lot of organizations or educational institutions. But if your organization does not already make use of SAML, um, you can use services like Okta or OneLogin. And, um, you know, there are also open source tools that are, you know, a no, a no cost way to get started. So we've also um, released an update to our Terminus command line interface. Terminus lets you interact with Pantheon through the command line. So rather than having to click around on the dashboard, you can, you can script things through Terminus or do, do one-off you know, operations with Terminus. Our new release comes with um, machine tokens. So it supports token-based authentication. And that's really um, a must-have if you're doing any sort of continuous integration. Um, of course, you don't want to put your, your username and password on Circle or Travis CI, Jenkins. Um, you can generate a machine token, um, you know, put that wherever you'd like, and then you could revoke it as well. So um, Terminus also includes an advanced um, interface to track uh, workflows on Pantheon. 
So kind of digging into the um, to Quicksilver platform hooks, um, we, we have some examples of what you can do, but right now you can do things like update um, your issue tracker, like Jira, for example, based on um, you know activity on your on your Pantheon site. You can when you're, when you're pulling your database back from live to to dev, you can run a script automatically to sanitize the database. You can do things like post not notifications to Slack. You know that'll help keep your team in sync and um, clear CDN caches on deploy. These are just a few of the examples. Um, you can also integrate almost anything via simple webhooks. So you know, some of these things you might have been used to doing over and over again. Maybe every time, maybe if you're using a CDN, when you deploy to live, you have to go into your CDN, you have to manually clear the caches. Um, now you can set it, a one-time setup, we'll make it every time you deploy to live, it'll clear the CDN caches. Every time you pull down the database to dev, it'll sanitize the database. So the idea is you do the one-time setup and then you're good to go. All right. Um, so again, the, we have some examples available. Um, check out um, the GitHub repo. Um, there's a growing collection of examples and definitely pull requests are, are welcome. If, if you have an idea, if you've managed to, to implement something, definitely share with others. And um, you know the way that you set up uh, Quicksilver platform hooks is you'll um, define the workflow in Pantheon YAML that you want to hook into. So whether that's a sync code operation, every time you're pushing code to a dev or multi-dev environment, or every time you deploy to test or live, every time you do a clone database or a clear cache operation. So these are the four um, workflows you can hook into. You can define those in the Pantheon YAML file. And in the Pantheon YAML file, um, basically, um, you can configure it so platform hooks will respond by running the Quicksilver operations listed for that workflow in Pantheon YAML and then stored um, in, in your code repo. So you're going to want to put it in a private directory, which is not web accessible. And um, you know, that's where you'll put the, the script. It'll be a little um, more clear with the next slide, I think. So this is an example of the Pantheon YAML config file. This is a, a very simple case, um, you know, API version one. The workflow that's being defined here is sync code. You could do before or after, and we're saying after a sync code operation, run a web PHP script, and um, the description there is clear cache after the code push and it'll invoke that script. So that's, that's, that's basically all there is to set it up. And here's another example of, um, this is kind of a, a script, like a hello Quicksilver, hello world script, um, and that'll give you some debugging information. You can see there the, um, the print R to, to print out the post, and the, the pass, you can also do pass through. So, so that's like a, a debugging script that, that might be valuable to you when you're, if you're um, wanting to make your own Quicksilver integration, you'll probably want to check out the, you know, what, what um, variables are available to you. Um, but the examples out of the box, they've, um, you can just copy those and, and go. One thing we want to make sure you're aware of is that um, these, these scripts are subject to a two minute timeout. So after 120 seconds, they'll timeout. Um, on, on the roadmap, we do have um, Drush, native Drush, and WPCLI operations. So right now, that the, w, the, the web PHP operation is the only one available, but the Drush and the WPCLI operations, those should get around that two-minute timeout, and you know those might be more suitable. Like let's say you're doing a massive search and replace on a database that takes more than two minutes, um, something like that would would probably be a better better fit. One other thing that you can make use of when using Quicksilver is um, a secrets.json file. So this file you'll want to put not in version control because it's secret. So the scripts you'll want to put under version control, but the secrets, um, you know, put those in files private. That's where you can keep machine tokens, Slack web webhook URLs, keys, 
So files is not in Git, and um, depending if you're using WordPress or Drupal, it'll be like sites default files or WP content uploads, but there's also a symlink right to files if you SFTP. So you're gonna have to add that to all environments um, because it's not in version control. It won't deploy with code. So when you're working with secrets.json, um, you know, just put it in every environment, dev, test, and live. When you create new multi-dev environments, you should be good to go because it will copy the files over. There's also a script that can help you manage the, the secrets.json file if you don't want to do it manually. And now I'm going to pass it over to Dave at MindGrub. Great. Uh, thank you, Ari. Uh, so I'm Dave Wyckoff. I've been here at MindGrub for about six years. Uh, and we are an agency. We generally do web apps, social apps, and mobile apps. Uh, but I am going to focus this on the web part of it. Uh, that's my role here at the company. Um, so for the most part, the main thing you should learn about an agency is that agencies generally deal a lot with clients, and they deal with a lot of clients. Um, so each project doesn't just have three environments, but we also have a fourth environment. Um, so Pantheon has the standard dev test live already set up, uh, but we also need some place for clients to actually look at the changes before they're actually pushed live. Uh, so we have a staging environment. Um, we generally use multi-dev for this, but because there's another environment, there's more pushes, and because there's more, more pushes for code, uh, you could always have things go wrong. Um, we have a lot of separate uh, departments here, and we deal with a lot of different people. Um, our engineering team consists of about 50, uh, 25 people, um, and that includes mobile and web. Um, but because there are so many people, it, it's sometimes difficult to convey some um, manual uh, stuff over from one, one developer to another. So it, it's very important to us that we, we learned pretty much really early on that we need to perfect automating uh, even the little things. Uh, if we don't automate something, if we don't have some automatic way to do it, then a human has to do it. And humans always, always have human error. Uh, no matter, no matter what you do, if you, if, uh, if you just forget to do one simple thing, uh, then you're not quite sure if it's going to be pushed correctly or not. Um, so the main thing that we generally uh, like to automate are is movement configuration uh, across environments, which, as you know, is a pretty important thing on the web um, because. Uh, you have code and a database, and some of the, the database is not actually a configuration, it's content, or most of it, I should say. Uh, code quality enforcement is obviously really important, so this is like code checks. We learned this, again, really early on. Uh, we have to make sure that all the code that's going through is, is up to par to our standards, as well as, it, obviously, the main thing is that we don't want anything to break. Uh, and continuous integration is the last thing. This is like Jenkins or Circle CI. Uh, we generally use Jenkins, but it doesn't really matter. Um, so for, for moving configuration between environments, um, for Pantheon, there's generally Drupal and WordPress, um, and both of them have their issues with configuration. And for Drupal 7, there wasn't really a core way to move configuration uh, across separate environments, but features came in. Features is a module that many of you heard of. Uh, if you haven't, it essentially lets you export some of the database into code and then revert it on, on demand. Uh, but what that actually means is that you need to run commands. And you need to run commands to revert and, and uh, also update. But whenever you push code, uh, you need to revert the, the changes from the code and push it to the, the database. Uh, you can do this using Drush, and we love Drush. Uh, we love automating, as we said before. But we don't want to have to do this every single time. So we, 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 the fact is that we can use Quicksilver for this. And as Ari said, that we can just, one of the first things we did was ship a, a revert features command so that every time we push code, every time we deploy code, it's reverted. Uh, Drupal 8 has CMI built in, so even, but even though it's built in, so this is essentially configuration uh, management, but even though it's built in, it, it's, we still have to run th those commands. And so the fact that we can actually have fine-tuned uh, ways to actually do something on, you know, push for code as well as deploying, uh, it's very important. Uh, for WordPress, there's WPCFM. 
which again has the same set of issues. So, but all of this, like I said, can be automated using Quicksilver, and we've we've already done this, and it's it, it makes makes it a lot. Uh, it, you you feel a lot better about it because you don't have to, have to double check that everything is reverted in, in a safe. It, it just automatically happens, and ca cache can be cleared automatically. Whatever else wants to be cleared automatically. So, for code code quality. Uh, Drupal 7 has simple tests built in in this PHP unit in Drupal 8. Um, and we, we generally like to use mess detectors and code style and JavaScript linting. So, so, but we could, didn't have a way to automatically do this when you, when you pushed on Pantheon before Quicksilver came out. So we had Jenkins previously set up to run tests uh, whenever you, you push, uh, push to a repo. But now you can just use the Pantheon repo and every time you push, run off some tests. And then whenever something happens, you can uh, alert whoever uh, broke it to actually, you know, make sure that they know that what they did uh, is going to affect it. You can also just double check to make sure that uh, there's no debug code in it, like common functions like var dump or DPM from a develop module. And you can also just double check the, the stuff that you're pushing up meets the Drupal code standards, which we heavily use in MindGrub. Uh, and the code standards themselves don't matter as much that everyone's consistent. Because at an agency, you deal with a lot of different people. And, and the main thing is that everything is consistent between it so that people can move between projects without having to uh, learn things that really don't, don't really matter to developers. Developers want to write code. Uh, they generally don't care about other things like just, just code standards. Uh, so for continuous integration, again, we used we use Jenkins here in my group. Uh, it doesn't really matter. But what I'm very excited about about this and why I really wanted to mention this was that be because uh, you uh, can't run everything in Quicksilver, uh, you can now just ping Jen uh, Jenkins or your other continuous integration from Quicksilver and then do whatever you want. As Ari said, there is a two minute uh, timeout, but it doesn't really matter when you just push to your own continuous integration and there, it opens up a lot more possibilities because there isn't really, there already is a lot of solutions out there for continuous integration. It's already done. There's plugins out there for Jenkins. There's CI. All of this can just be, is, is just kind of like a, a puzzle piece that fits into this. Uh, and, and it kind of really just makes it so that whatever, if you can dream it, you can make it a reality in this case, because now you actually have a way to tell if something was pushed. Uh, so, so between all these pushes, though, we, we definitely have to make sure all of our communication is good, because here at MindGrove, again, we have uh, many different teams. We have quality assurance, project management. We have the engineering team. And we do a lot of mobile apps and web apps. And so the mobile apps generally have some type of API, uh, generally done in, in Drupal on, that's served on, on Pantheon. Uh, but we essentially need to communicate all of this. Uh, and we generally use Slack, but we still have a lot of issues with this. So I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to Brian, who's going to talk a little bit more about how we deal with this, this problem where, where it's all about communication. Thanks, Dave. As Dave said, my name is Brian. I've been with MindGrub for about four years now. And while I've been with MindGrub, I've worn many hats from junior developer all the way up to now where I co-run the web engineering team with Dave. One of the big things that Dave and I focus on as part of our role here is worrying about deployments for customers. I'm sure a lot of you out there are agencies that are deploying and making updates to live sites that customers are using right now um, to browse the web or have social media interaction with or have their customers purchase things from their site. And therefore, deployments can become very, very high stress. You don't want to break the site. You don't want to disrupt something. If some celebrity just tweeted out about the site, you don't want to take the site offline to try and do an update. And for that reason, you know, deployments need to be as stress-free as possible. So a lot of what the work I do here at MindGrub is sort of simplifying our deployment process and worrying about how can I take the stress away from those deployments? As Dave said, we're an agency. So Dave and I might touch 15 different projects or more over the course of the week that we need to worry about, be concerned with, jump in, do something, do a release, and then jump out. There's lots of different moving pieces to that. 
you know, we're focused on the release, but there's also a, an engineering development team behind it who worked on the code. We might have a quality assurance team associated with it who's worried about testing it to make sure everything looks good. We might have mobile engineers who are working on a mobile app that are trying to time a release to the iOS or the Android app store with the release of these new features to the production environment. And of course, we also have project managers who are being that liaison with the client to make sure that the client is okay with us doing a deployment right now. So because of that, communication is very, very important. As Dave said, we use Slack and we set up channels within Slack for every project that we have going on. There might be five channels for a client if they have five projects with us, but the idea is that anybody can go into that channel and all of the involved parties are there. Anybody can look through and see exactly what's happening, what the state of the project is, without having to go and knock on people's doors or send them one-off emails and messages asking them what the state of things is. Because of this, it was really important to us to integrate our deployment process with Slack as much as possible. And we're gonna show you a demo in just a minute, but I did wanna point out there that there is a link on the screen um, to the project on GitHub, and we'll go to that in just a minute. Before I jump into the demo, I wanna walk everybody through what's going to happen because it all happens very quickly. Like I said, releases are sort of a, a high stress moment when you're touching production code that could have hundreds or thousands of people visited all at the same time. So our deployment process is as streamlined as possible. What you'll first see is a change made via the Pantheon dashboard and we'll commit some code via a feature. From there, we'll switch over to Slack to the channel we have dedicated to the project that's going on. In there, I'll be serving as the, the release manager for this project and I'll say, hey, we're ready to do a release. Dave, as the project manager on this project, is everything looking good from your perspective to actually proceed with a release? And Dave has the opportunity to say, no, the client's in the middle of a big marketing campaign right now, we can't touch the site. Or you can say, yeah, everything looks good. From there, we'll actually use Slack to trigger the Pantheon release. We do that through a middleware layer that provides a slash command within Slack to be able to trigger a deployment for a particular Pantheon site. It uses Terminus as a library hooked up with a Drupal site to provide the API that talks back and forth. And from that, we also then use Quicksilver and some other tools such as Jenkins to do some automated testing after we do the deployment, as well as revert features. And finally, once the demo is all done, we'll pull up the site to the environment we just deployed in so that we can see everything truly did go well. So let's go ahead and jump into the demo now. So here you can see the standard Drupal administration people screen. It's done via the admin views module. And we're gonna go ahead and make a modification to this display. Our client requested an addition to the display that includes each user's favorite Star Wars robot. This was sort of timed around the release of the new film. And so it seemed fitting to make it right there exactly what each person's favorite robot was. So we go into views. We add it. For those people familiar with views, this should look fairly standard to you. We go ahead and we change the order of it to move it up some right around the roles. And then we'll go ahead and save that change. We can scroll down to the auto preview if we'd like and see that, yes, we do have some people who have some favorite Star Wars robots already in this system. This is good. And we get the green success message. If we go back to the administration screen, we can see we've got some people who like the GNK, BB-8, R2-D2, C-3PO, a whole range of different robots that are available throughout the Star Wars films. We'll now go ahead and commit this to a feature using the features module. We also at MindGrub use a module called Features Builder, which automatically generates our features for us and groups the different pieces of functionality into different modules rather than having to decide on our own. And so you can see here, we can just check this checkbox to enable the modules it generates and click the build button and it goes ahead and builds all of those features for us without us having to get into the nitty gritty feature pages. Now I'll switch back over to the Pantheon dashboard where you can see we have 132 files ready to change, including the Devel module, which we added to generate all those users with their favorite robots. And down here at the bottom, we should see the feature changes. Yep, there they are. This is good. 
So everything's proceeding as normal. This would be standard development, even if we hadn't automated our agency too much. We'll add a commit message, add develop module, as well as update features to include favorite Star Wars robot on admin screens for users. There we go. We'll hit commit. There we go, committing the code changes. And now you can see we're sort of getting our Slack channel ready here to do a deployment. If I switch back over to the test environment, we can see that we have some commits ready to deploy. Normally we would deploy those via the Pantheon dashboard, but because we've sort of automated this process to cut down on the number of different places we need to go, we're gonna do this all through Slack. So you can see here I'm asking Dave, Dave, it looks like we're ready to push. You ready on your side? Before I send the message, I, as the release manager, do sort of a final pass through what's going on to make sure everything looks stable from an engineering standpoint. This could also be, you know, hey, I'm pinging the guy next to me to ask him a question about a ticket, or even if somebody just comes in and interrupts me from what I'm doing, I have that opportunity to take care of it before we jump into the release. Now I'm all good to release, so I say, Dave, are you ready? Dave does a quick check with the client to make sure they're okay okay with us doing a release. He makes sure other parties involved who need to be coordinated with this are also good. And then once he's okay, he'll post back that says, yes, everything looks good. I'm ready for release as well. Looks like he's checking with just one last person. There we go. All right, so he's given us the key to release. We are all set and good to go. I'll do first here, do a slash Pantheon help command which will show you all the different options we have available to us to run via Slack. It includes things like getting a list of sites that we have in Pantheons, but the key one is this slash Pantheon deploy and then an environment. And also here you can see, as I said, we have different channels for every project we have on Pantheon. So we set default sites to associate projects um, in Slack with sites in Pantheon. So we don't need to specify the site. Now I go ahead and I run slash Pantheon deploy test and I'll pull up Terminus here to run Terminus workflows watch so I can see what the platform is doing. We got a Slack message back from our integration that says, hey, a deployment was initiated to this project by B. Thompson myself. This way, anybody else who's watching the project in Slack knows what's going on. If I click over here to the Pantheon dashboard, we can see the de uh, deployment started. And now we'll go back to watching Slack here to see updates as they happen in real time. The advantage of this for me and for Dave and for other folks at MindGrub who are doing releases is now we don't have to have people sitting in our office or coming and knocking on our door or pinging us in Slack separately going, hey, what's the status of the release? What's the status of the release? Did we push yet? Are we live yet? It's all right here in Slack. They can just join the channel, look and see exactly what's going on. Keep in mind in just a minute here, we'll have Quicksilver fire off the features revert it will also post back to Slack. There we go. So it says, hey, for, we deployed, and it includes a message that says we deployed to this environment and features have been reverted. It includes links to go directly to the Pantheon dashboard if we need to, as well as visit the site. Our Pantheon Slack integration posted back and said, hey, the, the true deployment through the Pantheon dashboard is finished. And now Jenkins has even posted back and said, hey, we ran the automated tests you have configured for this project after deployment everything looks good. If I switch back over to the test site here, you can see the deployment listed there, and I'll go ahead and log in, if I can remember the right username and password. And once I log in, I'll go to that administration people page. And we can see that we now have this new column on this page as well. So this is a completely and entirely deployed through the Slack interface. I didn't have to go into the site if I didn't want to. All of that was handled. The testing was handled by Jenkins through our automated tests and then follow up manual testing by our QA team. And I didn't even have to go into the Pantheon dashboard to trigger the deploy that way. Um, I can do it all through Slack without opening other things. You'll also notice there that we did do the, the, um, the automated testing through Jenkins. The reason we use Jenkins for a lot of our, our complex tasks, such as running automated tests, is it gets us around the 120 second timeout limit that Ari mentioned earlier with the, uh, 
Quicksilver integration. Those tests such as running Wraith or running a simple test or PHP unit, which could take longer, we offload to our, our continuous integration system. So while that was all really cool, we still are looking to see how we can enhance our process further. We have a couple of future enhancements that are sort of on the roadmap. One of the things we want to do is integrate it with our ticket tracking system. We use a JIRA right now, but the idea would be after we trigger the deployment, our automation suite goes in and automatically updates all of those tickets in JIRA to indicate what just happened to them. They got deployed to the, uh, to the test environment or to the live environment. We also want to integrate polling via Slack. What do I mean by polling? Well, you saw there that one of the, the sort of workflow was I, as the release manager, posted a message that said, hey, I think we're ready to deploy. Dave, do you think everything looks good too? And then I had to wait to actually run that deployment command until I got the okay back from Dave. What we'd like to do is automate that even further where I, as the release manager, can trigger a release and Pantheon will, or the, I'm sorry, the Slack integration will say, a release has been queued we need the following people to give approval. And it will then actually listen to the next messages in that Slack channel to wait for those people to post the appropriate approval. And once it gets them, automatically kick off the integration or the deployment process. That way, even if I get called away to a meeting or I have to step away from my desk for a, mo a moment, I can still do the deployment because I've already queued it. And finally, we want to also enhance our Terminus integration with Slack to do things such as provide uh, one-time login links for users that in case we don't have the password. So with that, I'd like to turn things back over to Ari. Wow, thanks Dave and, and Brian. That was an amazing demo. Really cool to see how you're, you're using Quicksilver and really leveraging it to, to do all sorts of really cool stuff. So um, just now I'm just gonna kind of walk through a basic setup of Terminus. If you wanna get um, Terminus, um, Quicksilver, getting things going. So I'm just going to Google Terminus and Pantheon. Here's the Terminus project. And I'm going to install with curl. So I'm just copying that, pasting it in. You can see above, I, I did a fresh clone of the, the site repo. So I, I clo cloned the, the site's code repository locally. Um, and I just installed Terminus. So I'm going to check the Terminus version, it's 0.11 which is great, it's the latest. I'm gonna to try to authenticate. Um, and it's saying, uh, it wants me to generate a machine token and it gives me a URL to do that. So I'm just gonna copy and paste that URL into my browser. And it should load up um, the dashboard and an interface that, that lets me choose the name of the machine token. It's defaulted to Terminus on Inc. And here it's actually giving you the, the token. It's telling us that we can only view it once for security purposes. So when you copy this, you're gonna to wanna to put it in a safe place. So I paste that in um, and now I'm authenticated um, using that machine token. Um, I get the, the nice, um, the art that shows us I'm authenticated. And I'm just gonna walk through it, um, installing a, a Terminus, I'm, I'm sorry, a Quicksilver example. So let's take a look at the Quicksilver example. There's a bunch of them here. I'm gonna check out the new relic um, deploy marker. So first thing, I'm gonna go to settings, add-ons and click add to make sure I have new relic enabled on this site. New relic is great for monitoring. It's like X-ray vision for your application's performance. So if you're trying to optimize things, um, it can give you a lot of insight. Also, if things are getting slower um, after deployment, um, it's, it's good to, to, to look into New Relic to give you insight into what might, might have made things slower. So I'm just looking at this example. I chose the raw file. I'm making the private directory, going into the scripts, downloading that, um, the New Relic deploy.php file. Now I'm just going up and I'm just gonna paste in this Pantheon YAML file. So I know this is a little quick, but we wanted to um, just give you a quick demo of, of how to get Quicksilver moving. Um, you'll note I have a typo there. And let's see what happens when I try to commit this stuff. So I'm, I'm, I'm adding the Pantheon YAML file and the private directory. In that private directory, put in the new relic deploy.php. So just to back up a second, what we're doing here is we're making it for every time you deploy code, 
it's going to let New Relic know, um, basically put a, a, a deployment marker, it's called there. So this lets you kind of know, um, you know, how your site's performance might have been impacted by a certain deploy. So I'm pushing that up, and here I'm getting an error saying changes to Pantheon YAML detected, but there was an error in AP. I, so I just need to fix that typo. So it actually prevents you from committing. That's something I wanted to show. Um, if you're having trouble getting it set up, definitely check for output to see if your Pantheon YAML file is valid or not. So there I'm making it valid. I'm going to push it back up. Now I should get a successful message. The first time, um, it, it wasn't a valid YAML file. Um, so we prevented it from being committed. Next time it says changes detected, looks good, successfully applied. So the next thing is I'm going to just deploy all of these changes through. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do terminus workflows watch. And going here to test. I'm just going to deploy this through to test. I'm going to open up New Relic. And it looks like I was logged into a different, um, a different New Relic account. So I'm going to log out of that one and log back in. Let's see here, just a second. Um, Terminus Workflows Watch also takes a site argument. So I'm, I'm adding that on the end, Terminus Workflows Watch, site equals cloud integration tools demo. Um, let's see, why isn't it working here? Let's see, oh, maybe the, um, I'll, I'll, I'll get my, my sites list. It's looking for a site that I hadn't had in my cache locally. So Terminus has a local cache. If you create a new site, you might need to run Terminus Sites List to get that new site in. All I'm doing now is logging out of New Relic, logging back in. That's just because I was logged into a different New Relic account. So I logged out, I'm logging back in. If I go down to Deployments, you can see here that nothing's been tracked so far. So that's just to show um, we haven't logged any deployment markers yet. So I'm going to deploy this through to live. And I updated my Terminus sites list. So now I should be able to do the Terminus workflows watch command. It's watching the workflows. And that was the same command that um, Brian was using. Kind of gives you some insight into to the workflows, um, as well as any Quicksilver scripts that are being run. It'll give you output from those scripts. And I'm just going to put in a, a dummy file here. So this is, there's nothing really here, but I'm going to um, commit this. Oh, it looks like I don't actually have a valid repo here. <laughs> okay, there we go. So I'm going to add this t test file. So I deployed the, the, the Quicksilver script, the Pantheon YAML file from dev to test to live. Now I'm just doing a test deploy. So first you're gonna to wanna to deploy all the Quicksilver scripts through to all of the environments, then you can test to see if it's working. So here I'm just adding a test file. Um, I need to make sure that I actually add it to, to Git. So I'm adding it. I'm gonna commit and push it back up should be pushed to, to dev. Here I'm looking at the, the terminus output, the deploy markers. Let's look at, here's the commit incoming, syncing code on dev. So now I'm gonna wait for that to, to sync up. Then I should be able to deploy it through to test and we can see that this example is all working. So again, to review, you know, we added that Pantheon YAML file that points to the, the example script, and that script was in, in the private directory, and now we're just deploying a, 
a test, you know, just a test file to make sure everything's working. And here you can see it's telling us deploying code to test. So once this happens, we should actually see some additional output from the Quicksilver script. Um, and that'll let us know that it actually made the post to New Relic. And then if everything looks good, um, then, it, then it should show up there. Um, and there's not really any traffic on this site, so I wanted to, to show you a screenshot of just New Relic, um, doc, their documentation. So there we go. The deployments page is the screenshot I wanted to show. Um, once you have a deployment marker, it'll give you all sorts of graphs based on that deployment. So let's go back. Oh, there's all sorts of output here. Um, New Relic. So we should have a deployment marker here. So there you go. Um, and of course, if this was a live site with a lot of traffic, you'd be able to actually see some data here. And the important thing is that this allows you to um, you know, track your site's performance based on deployments. Once you've set it up once, it'll just automatically happen. So that's just a simple example of using New Relic, but you can also do um, Slack notifications. That's in that example repo. Um, so yeah, that, that should be enough to get you started. I think now we probably want to um, open it up for questions. Righty, so we've been taking questions during the presentation, um, but feel free to continue to submit. Um, we're going to launch off with our first question now, and that is, the Quicksilver hooks must be defined for each account, or can you do this globally for an organization? So some common uh, scripts apply for all accounts in the org. So you're going to want to set this up on a site-by-site -site basis. So if, and I would, if you have them in version control, though, and you have like a, a custom upstream, you could set, set that up, you know, all the scripts upstream, and then all, all the sites downstream can use the common set of scripts. Brian, did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, I was just going to say that the, um, when we first got started at MindGrub with the Quicksilver integration, the first one we did was to push out the features revert via our custom upstream. And we had um, that Quicksilver integration pushed out to all of the sites on the Pantheon platform over the course of maybe 45 minutes to an hour. Um, so definitely, if you're not using custom upstreams and you're an agency using Pantheon, look into that and talk to your, your support folks with that because it definitely will help you roll out these sort of changes in automation across all of your projects very quickly. For sure, yeah, definitely check out our documentation for custom upstreams. Ready for our next question we have, does Pantheon have a solution for building parts of a website during the deployment? Things like compiling CSS from SCSS, compiling TypeScript, uh, minifying images, and JavaScript. So we, we actually don't have um, a way to, to do that natively within P Pantheon, but you could post to you know, a CI server that, that could do those, those build steps. Is that something that, that you all are doing, any, anything like that, Dave or Brian? Oh, uh, we aren't yet, but that is going to probably, we, we, that, that exact question, we actually have been asking ourselves a lot um, about actually compiling it in the CI as opposed to compiling it ourselves. Uh, we've messed with the idea of doing it in Jenkins and before. Uh, we haven't done it yet. Uh, the main issue, I think, with Pantheon supporting it is that there's, it, it's very difficult because there's a lot of different types of SAS versions and there's small details between them. It would be very hard to actually support everything for it. Um, so I, I think definitely what I, I would do and what we uh, Minecraft may do in the future is where we would just essentially have a separate stream uh, or a separate site that has a bare bones copy of Drupal, uh, either the method where you only store uh, your custom stuff inside of it and not core Drupal, and then essentially builds from scratch. But referring to this question, more importantly, it, it only the SAS goes in and then it pushes the CSS up to Pantheon uh, and, and everything else. So essentially Pantheon is like, is everything is built in there and you don't push to it directly without pushing to the other repo that, that uh, triggers the CI. Yeah, that sounds like a good way to go. And um, I think you can look 
forward to, to seeing, you know, more documentation on how to, how to make that, that work. Righty, our next question is, how do you capture the important decisions in Slack? Sure. So part of, of one of the challenges of Slack that I think anybody who's used Slack will quickly come to realize is it makes things very, very noisy. And you have to be able to parse out what's important and what's not important. And the way we do that right now at MindGrub is through mentioning people and at adding them um, so that they get the notifications about it and then configuring your Slack in such a way to make sure that if for some reason you don't acknowledge a, a notification right away, you get the emails for it. Slack also has some history rules and retention that you can set up um, that are through the administration interface. Uh, I guess I'll add on to that. Um, so we also use Basecamp uh, for our more important decisions, I would say, the ones that we want to be actually ingrained, uh, kind of etched in stone. Um, so we may have a conversation, but if there's essentially any conversation, if there's any strong point that's documented somewhere else, uh, we still use Slack for uh, casual conversations and other things. And we uh, obviously, as Brian mentioned, a lot of project related stuff. I would say a good example of us doing a lot of communication right there is uh, for me right now, I'm working on a, a project very closely with our mobile team and thus I have to make web services. Uh, and we, we have Android and iOS. There's a lot of different people involved in this uh, and they're both building that at the same time. So essentially what I, I'm using Slack for is that we can talk for about the nitty gritty details about the, the web services and the actual formatting of it. That doesn't really matter too much. And then we're using the, the Slack functionality for adding a post with the, like the check boxes and to do's and stuff. Um, so that way, it, it, and we have all of those as well as uh, like wires and, and, and links to very important things in the header of the, the Slack channel. That way you can come in and you can actually see what the important things are. Ready, the next question is, do you have a deployment checklist? We do, for every project that we push out the door, we create a push doc, um, which includes a list of all of the different tickets that we've worked on that are going out as part of that deployment. And then we also run um, deployment checklists for those big pushes that have a lot of manual steps. We're trying to get away from deployment checklists for the week to week, day to day pushes, because it sort of implies that you're doing a lot of manual steps that you need to check off as you complete them. And with the goal being to automate as much as possible, my ideal deployment checklist would be one step called start deploy. Um, and everything else would be automated from there on out. But we're not fully there yet. We definitely use deployment checklists where it's appropriate to um, make sure we hit those key manual steps and also when we're launching the site. That's cool. I'd be interested to see your, your deployment checklist. Maybe that's something we can get on the docs. We do have a, a go live checklist. So the first time you're deploying to live and actually taking your site live, you'll definitely want to check out the go live checklist. Yeah, that's, that's generally what the our majority of, of our concerns is the first time you go live, what to do essentially make sure that, that uh, everything is set up correctly. Righty. Next question is, what is the benefit of running a staging environment outside of the Pantheon workflow? So uh, Pantheon only supports the three main environments uh, and we needed a fourth environment. We're still using Pantheon for this and that's where we use multi-div, uh, which is fantastic. Uh, we essentially multi-div, for those unfamiliar, lets you just spin up a, another environment at your will and have a separate branch. Uh, the name kind of implies that it's for each developer to have its own environment, but you can use it for other things as well. Uh, and it, it's so quick to, to uh, actually just spin up a separate, separate thing for a demo. Uh, so essentially we use that fourth environment so that we have a, a, uh, all four of them in line. We don't use it for staging, but we, we, we use it for uh, uh, dev, for example. And then we push up to test and, 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 and push up. I would add to that that because we're an agency and we have a lot of client work, a lot of the features we're working on, not necessarily bug fixes, but big feature releases, require sign off not only by MindGrub's internal QA team, 
but also by our client, you know, our stakeholders in the project from the client who want to make sure the feature is working as intended. And by running a separate environment, um, which we call staging for them to review, it allows us to iterate faster and be working on the next set of changes and have them in review with our QA team without disrupting the review our client is doing. All righty, we'll take it to the next question. And that is, when using a CI server, is there a way to configure a CI server to build a production version version of a JS front end app using web, uh, web hack, gulp, grunt, et cetera, and then deploy the production version to Pantheon? Um, so the short answer is yes. Anything you can do via CI, um, a lot of our, our CI scripts are more bash scripts um, or other custom code that we've sort of written to run a set of a series of steps. So anything that you can run via the command line um, on your local computer to sort of do that deployment and build, you can automate with a CI server. Um, in terms of the actual specifics as to how to do that, um, we would need to know more about how that's actually working and what your setup is. But at a high level, yes, it's definitely possible. Yeah, I, I think the important thing to just think about that is that you're building the site in your CI and you're pushing it there. And then whatever is built from the CI is what you push to Pantheon, or specifically the production environment. All right. Next question is, is there a similar integration with HipChat like you have with Slack? There, there is. If you check out the Quicksilver examples um, repository, you'll find a, a HipChat example in there. So the... Um, the demo that um, that Brian did was a more advanced Pantheon Slack integration. In the in the Quicksilver examples repo, we have a Slack um, example which basically allows you to um, you know post notifications to Slack based on um, those four operations. So anytime someone clears the cache or deploys or you know pushes code or clones a database, you can post that to Slack. Um, the same example is there for for HipChat. So yeah. All righty guys, looks like that's all we have time for today. Thank you all so much for watching. If you have any questions or feedback, please visit our website where, you, where you'll you where you find a contact us page and we'll put you in touch with the best member of our team. Thanks for joining us, joining us this morning and have a great week everyone.